What is up, Bart? Have you recovered? Uh, yeah, I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> it was a long day yesterday. Well, uh, yeah, I was up yeah, early. Your, yeah, with your Arsenal Man City. Oh, what's in the mug, by the way? Sorry, I forgot to ask. Just coffee. Atlanta okay. United mug. Okay. He's wearing his Arsenal t-shirt, and he's got his Atlanta United mug yeah. out there. League Cup champions, you know, Conti Cup champions as of yesterday. So was up at the bar to watch that. Um, unfortunately, we thought it was going to be on Paramount Plus. It was not. They lied to us. Uh, oh. So we were watching it on our phones at the table. So uh, and then the game went into extra time, and we're trying to watch that while also watching the Arsenal Man City match uh, uh, on the yeah. men's side on TV. That was uh, fun. Yes. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you had a busy day, and I did see your photo on, <laughs> so. on, on social media. Uh, and apparently there was in the, the Chelsea Arsenal uh, cup final. There was there was a tete a tete and some pushing by Emma Hayes, the future US. Yeah, player. I I got to be honest, I wasn't like aware of this. And granted, I was watching on like you know a four inch screen, so um, <laughs> I couldn't see all of it. But uh, even the video I saw of what Jonas out of all did, it wasn't like I could see a little bit of why Emma was upset because he was definitely um, upset at Chelsea for some not getting a ball in quick enough, basically. But um, you know, I think it wasn't anything that most managers do. So I'm not quite sure what Emma was super upset about, but whatever people get heated after a game. And especially after you've lost a league's cup final to the same team two years in a row. So there you, yes. So th there you go. There's your shot. Uh, all don't right. Lose. There. Yeah. Don't lose. There are a, a couple of moments that I wanted to get into when it comes to refing down here, but let me start with the, she believes conversation. Uh, since it is coming here to Atlanta this weekend, when it comes to the She Believes roster, I know that it's been addressed on the Soccer for US POD. Uh, now that you've put the Soccer for US POD in the barn, people can listen to it here on the network, and you've had some time to think, how do you look at this roster that is coming here to Atlanta, and what are you anticipating from it in, in their look going up against these other three teams? Well, I think, first off, this is – feels like we're finally trying to turn the page from 2023 World Cup to whatever that next iteration of the U.S. Women's National Team is. So that's the biggest thing is you're seeing um, newer players, but also kind of a solidified new core, if that makes any sense, John. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You know, I think there are some players that are French players that are getting called in. And as much as I love her, Lily Johannes is one of those like, okay, well, let's see how she actually does for the U.S. Women's National Team. Let's see if she even wants to play. She still has a decision she could make if she wants to play for the U.S. or Netherlands. Um, you know, Corbin Albert had some things go on in her personal life over the weekend, but her teammate at PSG, uh, Eva Gaitino, is also in this roster. She's a center back. And while I don't necessarily think she's um, – a better option than anything we have. It's nice to see new faces and names brought in to the women's national team when it feels like for the longest time, you know, I think Vlatko kind of settled on his uh, World Cup roster way too early, which ended up biting him a little bit because he brought in some players who hadn't really played a lot uh, once the World Cup came around. So I, I'm hoping this is a good, like, um, first step of expanding the player pool so we have a full uh, assortment of players to choose from when a we have the olympics this summer and b we have the world cup in now three years time which by the way john yes we still don't have a host to turn no we do not no we do not uh jared before you go in the irish goodbye anything for bart yeah because we got the question brought up already uh you want to talk about the uh, the red card yesterday Okay, how clear so, cut it was. All right, so we'll go. Uh, you oh yeah, the 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 stomping on a player's calf. Yeah, the, the part where he tried to extract his calf muscle with a foot. Yes. Yeah, so here is <laughs> here is how it was called, uh, courtesy of uh, Steve Cangelosi, Danny Higginbotham, Apple TV Plus, Major League Soccer. Here's how it was called in the moment, and there's a little bit of uh, the beauty of replay. You get to see, you get to hear how Danny responded to it. But here is the Tehran Red. From yesterday. It's not what you would call a traditional winger that doesn't want to defend. He's mm. going to cover his mate. This is what they expected from him. Signed as a Georgian DP last year in August of last season. And we have a straight red card that comes out of the pocket of Rekovery and Lucas Spala. You just see, it's actually just as he comes in here. Oh, that's awful. That is awful. 
Such a poor, poor challenge. So Danny Higginbotham says it's a poor, poor challenge. He wasn't wrong. No, I mean, look, this was <laughs> as clear cut of a straight red as you're going to get because it really wasn't even within the scope of like trying to make a play on the ball, right? It wasn't a bad challenge that just went poorly. It was a dude just reaching out and trying to put his cleats in the back of another guy's calf. And that that is... Yeah, that was that was bad. And like I could I could see it from my seats and I was like directly behind the play. And as soon as he brought out the red, I was like, oh, yeah, that was like he must have stomped on his calf. And then you see the replay like, oh, yeah, he did. Um, It was bad. Um, And don't do that. That's my advice. (laughs) (laughs) My professional refereeing advice. Don't do that. (laughs) Don't don't try and extract someone's leg muscle. Yeah. See, and, 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 you know, that to me sounds like uh, I think your first soccer for US POD t-shirt involving cards. Don't do that. Literally, just put that on the shirt. Don't do that with like, and you can have it in yellow and in red. You can have two, two separate versions for, uh, for soccer for US POD. Just sit there and go, don't do that. Literally, and just have the two colors for the t-shirts. Um, when it comes to something that is that particularly egregious, as Jarek gives us the Irish goodbye, um, how much, I mean, and I guess, is this something that center refs think about when it comes to the, the instinct of wanting to go red versus thinking it through and, and going yellow and then upgrading it through VAR or something like that. When it comes to an egregious foul, when you have an egregious foul happen in front of you, yeah, how do you stop the instinct of going to what could, you know, I, I guess of trying to be too safe in the call and having it build, or do you just sit there and go with your gut and sit there and go, yeah, man, that was a red bang. I mean, how do you balance the idea of trying to slow things down and process the call before you pull the card out and figure out the severity of it in a situation like that? So I think actually VAR helps with that a lot because we can feel confident giving a straight red now, knowing that we can look at it again and so, oh yeah, okay. I didn't, you know, this isn't straight red. Well, we can bring it back. Um, Whereas like when I'm refereeing, I don't want to give a straight red uh, if I don't have to, because that obviously means that, especially at my level, a kid no longer gets to play in this game and possibly has, you know, matches after that, that he can't play. So I do think that now with VAR, you, you feel a little bit more secure in giving a red card immediately for what we think is a bad call. Mm-hmm. because you can go back and look and go, oh, okay, like I see what I see that this wasn't a straight red because of X, Y, and Z. Um, because sometimes you see a really nasty challenge. You go, whoa, that's a red card. And then you look back and you go, oh, actually, okay, not as bad as I thought. Um, but conversely, we have a lot of times where we can be a little bit quicker to give a, a yellow card where we go, oh, that's a bad challenge. You give a yellow card immediately to kind of calm the situation yeah. and not – make the other team mad as well because at this point tempers are flaring and i don't know if you know this john but grown adult men are not very good at controlling their tempers what and what what you can then do is then go back to var and go oh no this definitely was a red card um and obviously in the game yesterday i, I don't think var even had to check it i think they probably did a quick replay and said yep you got that right good job yeah um but yeah i think it does i think you have some sort of not freedom, but security to give a straight red because at that level, you have the ability to go back and check yourself. Whereas at my level or levels where you don't have VAR, it's really hard to give that straight red for a clear foul because you want to make 100% sure. You know, there's a difference between a red card for a guy throwing a punch versus a guy with a bad challenge. Now, again, what I think we saw yesterday would have been a red card no matter what. That was a very clear cut. And also right in front of the ref, it was – it was idiotic to a lot of things, but I think that just sums up Chicago fire at this point in time. So it 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 was it was what it was. It, there wasn't a whole lot of debate around it. Yeah, I, I do want to circle back to talk about the other uh, teams and she believes before uh, before you do eventually do say goodbye. But the other call that I wanted to get into this week with refing down here happened in the Premier League. And it was in the chaos of the Newcastle West Ham match. And Mm. dealt with uh, Anthony Gordon. And so here is that particular play as it was presented on NBC Sports, Peacock, and the Premier League. Once again, this is Anthony Gordon inside the 18, Newcastle and West Ham. Thanks again to our friends at uh, Peacock and the Prem. Guimaraes 
Longstaff, Phillips dwelled too long, Gordon's gone down. Well, more work for VAR in Stockley Park. It's all happening once again. And Gordon's a man that's down inside the penalty area, but he played a lovely ball to the back post. We're just going to see it here, Anthony Gordon. Does he get the, his foot in front of the ball? It's, can't actually see that with momentum there. I think he's actually been clipped inside the area. But I don't think Gordon actually does anything with the ball neither. It's pretty obvious from these pictures that there's no intent from Calvin Phillips. But it is deemed a foul. All right. So basically what happened, for those of you that did not have the chance to see it, Calvin Phillips, Anthony Gordon are chasing after a loose ball inside the 18, just outside the six. And as Anthony Gordon is trying to win possession, Calvin Phillips, once again, he's winding up and he's trying to clear but in the process of winding up and clearing, he makes contact with Anthony Gordon's leg first, <laughs> yep. and Gordon goes down, it goes to review, and yep. it's, it's, it's viewed as a foul in the chaos of that. And this is something that we've seen, we've seen in Major League Soccer, and we've seen it in the Premier League, and the idea of in a, in a backswing, that literally you're focused on trying to either clear the ball or shoot it, whatever the situation is, and in your backswing and follow through, you make contact with the opposing player, and then the discussion starts mm -hmm. from there. But really, what is there to discuss? Well, I don't know that answer, John, because this is a philosophical question that I, I struggle with because I, I think for me personally, something that I, I think that IFAB should talk a little bit more to American referees, and this is going to make people mad because I think that we have a unique <laughs> perspective on this, but – John, you've covered basketball before, right? You, yep. You're aware of the idea of vertical space mm -hmm. in basketball. Yeah, the principle of verticality, yes. Yeah, you know, you, you have that space from the floor to perpetuity upwards to the heavens, you know. Um, I think that soccer needs to take a little bit of that into the way that we call games sometimes because I think in this instant, Gordon kind of runs into um, Calvin Lewert um, um, vertical space, if you will, right? Yeah. It's not fully his, I get that, but you'd be hard pressed to tell me that he wasn't in control of that space with the ball there. Um, you know, I don't know if it was 100% his, I, I'll, you know, say that, yeah. but um, I, I think it's a, a tough call because he absolutely makes contact with Gordon and Gordon's the attacking player. So for some reason, we award that any sort of thing to the attacking player. Um, so I, I think it's, I, I it's just hard, right? Because yeah, no, Alex, exactly what you just said. Like, it, Cal, Calvin was there, mm -hmm. Gordon was there. So who's in control of that? Who, who who's in the control of that vertical space? I you know Calvin may have, yeah. Gordon may. The vertical space argument is just something that I think we need to think about because it's in this incident, uh, incident especially it's. It's something that would help clarify yeah. what's going on. We don't have those interpretational licenses under IFAB and soccer because that's just not something that we as soccer referees talk about. That I really do think that having some conversations with other sports officials would be helpful because um, sometimes they do have some things that allow us to view our games in a little bit different manner. Yeah, and uh, so those were the two plays that stuck into my mind. Our buddy Will and Huntsville, apparently from this past weekend in MLS Next Pro, uh, is talking in, well, what if, quotation marks. So here's the question for Barton. It's going to take up most of the screen, so you might have to look over the top. Oh, boy. Uh, I have a question for Barton. If the linesman is out of position, i.e. 30-plus yards from goal and 5 to 10 yards behind the ball when someone hits a long shot that goes off the bar, whose decision is the call? Because that was the situation in Huntsville. Ball went off the bar, was about a yard over the line, then spun back out. Both the center and the linesman looked at each other, waiting for the other to make a decision, and they ultimately decided no goal. Think World Cup Lampard for physics. Um, so what I'm imagining here is long distance shot. 
Yeah, it's it's tough because this happens a lot, right? Yeah. Where you're taking a shot from 30 some yards out. And of course the linesman's not in a position to call that because you know if the second to last defender isn't literally on the goal line at that point in time, then you're not gonna see that. And the linesman is trying to run toward the the end line, you know, or the goal line, I should say, yeah. when that shot is taken, but there's no way they're gonna get in position in time. Right. I I don't really have a great answer for you. I think the unfortunate reality is if you can't tell, you can't tell. And we have to keep playing on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, because Na- uh, Huntsville is associated with Nashville, I don't care. <laughs> and they probably deserved it in some way, shape or form. Sorry, Will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, it's like that That specific incident is hard, right? Yeah. Because as a, as a, a center of, you know, referee, I, I cannot really see that because even if I think there's space between the ball and the line, I have no clue if that ball is fully over the full line, you know, and for the linesman's perspective, they might be able to give some insight if they're looking at it. But even then, if they're not on the goal line or close to it, because I will fully say that sometimes being on the goal line makes it very hard to see if the ball actually crossed the goal line Mm -hmm. because you have lots of things in the way of you, but you know, regardless, you're not in a good position to make the call period. Um, it's hard to make that call. And you would hope that between the two of them, they would have been able to make a conversation and, and come to a conclusion, but it seems like they did and they just couldn't see. So it, in, you know, a league that doesn't have VAR, those are things that are going to happen, you know? Yeah. Um, I- it's just, it sucks, but that's the reality. Yeah, so when it gets to the point, uh, the what you need either is some kind of video review at <clears throat> Next Pro, or you need an eagle eye yeah. that is outside of, uh, you know, the and maybe MLS Next Pro. This is, I mean, I think they could have this technology but, of but the goal line game, technology. But every game is televised. You should be able. Well, to but have- televised and having televised and having cameras for VAR, John. You and I know that those aren't the same thing. True. Um, I do think that maybe this is an opportunity at this level because MLS Next Pro seems to be the guinea pig for lots of things. Yeah. Um, Which, by the way, predicting that MLS Next Pro in two years will have the offside as if you're fully past the line, uh, the last defender, will have the hockey offside role um, in MLS Next Pro. That's my prediction. All right. Um, I think they could try the GPS ball goal line technology Mm -hmm. um, because – I think I still think that's useful in today's day and age, even with VAR, because you do need to be able to make decisions before an actual decision is checked. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and you know, <clears throat> especially for goals, if you have something like that, um, and you stop play to check it, yeah. You know, we have the ability to start, restart with the drop ball. Yeah. Um, you have, and, and for a goal specifically. You need to check this. This is the most important action. Like if we're talking about game altering decisions, Mm -hmm. match vital decisions, I think a goal is probably the most match vital game altering decision. Um, And so I think that there need to be ways to still get that part right. But in this case, it's just unfortunate. That is what happens. This is, believe it or not, well, this is what we did for, you know, a hundred years of soccer history before (laughs) we had technology. You actually guessed and think and and you had guessed and sometimes uh, more than a hundred, John. I don't know what the sport started in what you know, they the Brits claim this started in what twelve hundred or whatever they pretend. Okay. Um, you know, but yeah, you know, I mean look, we've had how long have we had referees? How long have we had linesmen? We we have we are twenty maybe twenty years into actually having this technology to help us referee the sport. And before that we just had to guess. Yes. And so there there's still guessing that's involved, yeah. but I know that since we are all <laughs> children of technology yeah. um that we would be in that kind of a a vein so um we'll keep an eye we'll keep an eye on that kind of stuff so that was those were the two uh, moments but uh, alex continuing uh he says uh, with our with our play with calvin phillips and anthony gordon if it hadn't been in the box and instead it was gordon trying to shield the ball at the touch line alex thinks calvin would have still been called for kicking through again not much Calvin Phillips could have done differently, and that's the advantage you get when you have the quickness to position yourself aggressively. And I genuinely, genuinely, yeah, I mean, but that, that you're right, Alex. Like that's the problem, right? Like, yes, Calvin probably. There, what else is he supposed to do? You know, yeah. um, it, Gordon just got there 
if you want to say quicker, you know, and so that's that again, vertical position is something that I, I think we need to look at, but I don't, I, I think in this case, you can say, well, Gordon got to that vertical space quicker. Yeah. And, and those are just ways that you can kind of, at least what I do when I referee is that's one of those, those um, things that I can fall back on with the coach about my decision-making process. Um, and, and it is a good way to look at the decision-making process, especially when you're going to bar yes. because you can kind of freeze frame and go, okay, this is where it was. Who got there first? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. So uh, as we, before we, as we wait to see if uh, Drew can actually find some quiet space where he can give us the explicit warning for the morning, as he talks about his beloved United, uh, let's go back to She Believes because we'll circle back to that because I wanted to have Jarrett get in his question and about uh, refing down here before he left. Uh, when you look at She Believes and the, the four teams that are involved, what else sticks out to you about the other three teams and the U.S. trying to turn the page have it and having it start with this particular tournament here at Mercedes-Benz? Well, I think the first thing is that if I'm going to be like blunt, it's a little um, anticlimactic that the U.S. is going to play either Brazil or Canada in the final of the She Believes Cup because we just played them in, you know, back to back actually in the W Gold Cup. And, and these teams aren't drastically different um, than what we had back in February, uh, March, sorry. Um, so if you're asking me like that, that is a little bit of a bummer, yeah. but at the same time, when you evaluate the rest of the world and who you could get, these are the three best opponents you could ask for. So yeah. I get why they were scheduled, you know? Um, but I think most importantly, and I'm going to build off what Alex just said, like if, if you're in Atlanta and you want to come watch a U.S. national team game, this is going to be a great one to come watch. They just opened a 300 deck from what I was I was reading from Doug. We have sold out the soccer allotment, basically, which is an amazing testament to fandom here in Atlanta. Um, but you're going to see two pretty good teams. I mean, people forget this Japan team. There's some obviously some names and turning of the pages for them. This Japan team beat Spain, the eventual World Cup winners, beat them 4 nothing in Wellington over the summer that, during that World Cup. I was there. Um, and that was, I mean, that's how good they can be and are. Uh, you even think back to a year ago this time, Japan was the team that gave all U.S. fans the most concern as we watched the other team beat them on an Alex Morgan goal because Mal Pugh um, did, or uh, yeah, Alex Morgan goal because Mal Pugh did great things. Um, you know, Mal Pugh goal because Alex Morgan did great things, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what that um, series of events was. But Japan is a very good team. Mm -hmm. Very good. And people forget that they are a World Cup winner. <laughs> they, you know, they were the they were the team that beat the U.S. in 2011 in that final. Um, and this will be a very entertaining game for us to be able to watch here in Atlanta. Um, and the fact that we're going to have 42,000 plus fans, I mean, that's insane. Um, I would love for us to set a record for women's attendance in a non- like World Cup match, um, which we have the chance to do as shout out to Doug has been there recording for quite some time. Uh -huh. 